Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. My name is Mike Musto, and on today's episode, we have the editor-in-chief of Jalopnik, Rory Carroll. Now, one Jalopnik. Jalopnik is Jalopnik.com has been around for a long time, one of the best automotive websites out there for car culture. What's going on in the industry as far as OEMs? And just it's a wonderful place with some fabulous writers. So you gotta go check that out. But Rory, Rory has been at auto, he used to run Auto Week. Now he's the editor of Jalopnik. He is one of the most knowledgeable guys out there in the industry. Um, and he's joining us today to talk everything from project cars to SEMA to EVs in society and a little bit of new car buying. And speaking of car buying, as we are Hemmings, we obviously have the one of the world's largest classified sections with twenty five to 30,000 cars online at any given time. We also have our auction, which is great because you can buy stuff there like your favorite car. Uh, anyway, we'll be back in about three to four seconds with Rory Carroll from Jalopnik, and we will talk to you soon. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. On this episode, our guest is none other, none other than Rory Carroll, the editor in chief of Jalopnik. Just a a wealth of knowledge as far as automotive car culture, and one hell of a great guy, dude. How are you doing today? Very, very well. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be making my first appearance. Well, first, but not the last. Um, we, I saw you down when we were at Pebble Beach, which was amazing, and we all yeah. made it home, which was good. Um, yeah. So so tell me, what, what is new in the world of Rory Carroll? What is new in the world of Jalopnik? You came in there how, how long ago? Not that long ago, right? Uh, yeah, just over a year ago, um, or I guess a year last spring. Um, so we've been great. We um, have been, you know, we, we kind of shook off some, I, I guess, some uh, COVID hiccups early on and <laughs> got back to to – making Jalopnik what Jalopnik it kind of has always been. And um, yep. we're seeing a huge um, period of growth traffic wise. And we're, we hired some new people um, who I think, you know, uh, I don't know where or why the world keeps producing people who are good for writing for Jalopnik or that weird, but uh, <laughs> we've met, we keep managing to find them. And um, I think I, uh, they're doing great. Uh, the audience seems to love them, and um, we're actually getting ready to hire, I think, four or five new people in the next couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, it's going great, and um, it is a super fun site to to work at, and um, you know, we get to do stuff that that nobody else gets to do, and um, it, maybe a lot of that stuff that nobody else would want to do. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's been super fun. So. Um, yeah, that's the news from from the Jalopnik side. But um, other than that, we moved. You can see my shop uh, space behind mm -hmm. me. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just getting settled in and I'm trying to get this place cleaned up and get all my uh, detrius from 20 car <laughs> projects off the floor. And, uh, yeah, get settled. So, you know, talking about car projects, right? You've got You've got a really kind of fun little collection right i know you've got oh you could go through them but i know you've got your truck i know you've got your old german i know you've well two you got a couple of germans right what else no, you got i've got well when you say they're fun they're they're not fun for well, me necessarily. they're they're fun in theory um but no i have um i've got my lexus uh off-roader mm -hmm. uh, and then i've got um a, an old 911, uh, which maybe you can see if I tilt this a little bit right there. Yep, there it is. Um, covered in dust um, from being in storage again. While I moved. <laughs> uh, I've got a 48 Willys uh, CJ2A. Uh, this is a little Jeep that is like, um, I bought it from North Carolina, but it was a farm truck up in, in New York for its whole life. Um, so okay. it, it rusted. Um, and has a ton of kind of surface uh, paint damage from being out in the sun and, and being work truck, but is very solid underneath um, and has never been a part at all in any significant way. Uh, so never had a rebuild, never had a rebuilt transmission. Uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it, which is cool, except when something goes wrong, it's like there's this, you're at this point where it's like anything you do, I, I replace like, um, uh, uh, I replaced part of the exhaust and I've replaced a couple like minor brake things, but it's like anything you do, um, you're potentially embarking <laughs> on a project. Cause it's like, 
you know, it's like all these fasteners have never been apart. None of this stuff has been uh, maintained in any, right. you know, serious way except except uh, oil changes and that stuff. So it's like, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I've got a, a, well, I know I have a leak somewhere. I think it's rear main seal, but I don't, I can't tell exactly. But it's like, you start addressing that stuff and the car starts coming apart. And then it's like, well, you might as well. It's dangerous. So yeah, so I've been trying to avoid taking that car all the way apart um, for quite a while. Cause then it's like, you know, like I said, you're doing a restoration, which is not, I paid $2,300 for the car. That's not why I have it. Um, uh, so anyway, I've got that. And then um, I'm bringing back one of the, probably the most well-known project is uh, the Lada um, <laughs> car, which, uh, I bought from Canada with a group of guys when I worked at Haggerty, I think in 20, 2008, maybe, um, okay. raced it, uh, very successfully the first time, uh, and then very unsuccessfully the second time, uh, <laughs> crashed it. And we, we, not to digress, but we, um, we replaced the rear wheel cylinders, um, with, uh, wheel cylinders from a Toyota which were dimensionally identical on the outside. So we took the calipers to them. They fit uh, perfectly. The brakes worked, uh, theoretically worked great, um, which is amazing because I went to a hardware store with a Soviet part uh, in Traverse City, Michigan, uh, where I live, handed them the part with its CCCP stamping on it. And they're like, yeah, we can figure some out. And like the guy walked back, was gone for 10 minutes, came back with a Toyota wheel cylinder that fit. Great, incredible. Anyway, so we we fitted those, and then we never even up to the race and through the first race, we never had the um, any brake pressure. So you'd have to pump right. twice <laughs> to, get, to get brakes. Once you pump twice, you get great brake. But like uh, prior to that, uh, it, it would not slow the car down at all. You'd go almost okay. slower. So we determined that um, we should shorten the stroke of the uh brake pedal which was a decision made after way too many beers mm -hmm. and it was like oh we can just drill drill out change the the pivot point uh where it connects to the plunger and then we're golden don't have and, to push as far logic yeah and so we tested it and you know in the driveway it was like brake feels perfect really firm great we took it on the track and uh of course, the brake uh, pressure would build up, but it wouldn't release. Uh, so we kept we were just <laughs> building and building more pressure. So the the uh, front calipers um, got so hot on the racetrack that they melted uh, the interior seals uh, on the pistons, shot brake fluid all over uh, the front uh, front wheels. Perfect. Uh, which in, you know, in lemons, you have to use dot, fair, dot four. So I forgot what the flash point of dot, dot four is. I don't know if you'd know it, but it's very high. Um, anyway, the whole thing burst into flames. Sweet. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a catastrophe. We managed to get the car back on the track after an entire night of wrenching and then got hit by a Camaro. Um, so after that, the car sat in the garage for several years, moved maybe three times with me just sitting in like various shitty wow. garages okay. uh, like paying storage on this $500 car that had been wrecked uh and eventually uh a buddy in Boston uh Camille grabbed it uh, he writes for Hooniverse um he was like hey he's he's from Poland and he's like um he's we had the car all done up with a communist theme he is not uh, a fan of communism or communists <laughs> Uh, something in his youth so he um, he took the car took all the communist stuff off of it and um, started promising he, was, he said he was going to get it racing again um, hasn't happened and he he texted me a few weeks ago and was like hey if you want that commie car back you can have it and wow uh, so yeah it's coming back um we're uh brad brunell from jalopnik is yep sure going out to get it with the yeah, in radwood from uh he's going out to get it with his ambulance he's going to tow it back okay uh, and then drop it off up here when he comes up for the empire hill climb uh in september so 
it's coming back. The plan is to do a Jalopnik entry um, in Lemons, which should okay. be super cool. I, I mean, I think like um, about half the staff has like track experience and half the staff doesn't. <laughs> um, so I figured like what better way to get them some track experience than like throwing them into a lemons race, which is yeah, of course, because just, nothing ever goes bad. In lemons racing. No. Right. And your door to door, which is like a totally unintimidating way to get into oh, yeah. it. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's the plan as of now, uh, you know, obviously with, with any plan, it could uh, result in me um, storing a car. Uh, yeah. Now, now I have a, a huge barn. Um, mm -hmm. That's so, both good and bad because have space will fill. Obviously, you know this. It's certainly bad. I mean, I, I would like to think that it could be good for me, but um, the discipline is not there to say no to stuff. And the it seems so big, you know, like you look at it and you're like, Okay. Ah, nah. you're talking about well, never... yeah yeah and then somebody comes at you with like a world war ii military truck and you're like i could totally fit that in the barn we can put a boat in there oh boat? yeah the boats are built yeah so um yeah so that's the rundown of the project cars right now the jeep um is inexplicably not running um i i drove it onto the trailer in detroit um when we moved and drove it all the way back up here and tried to start it in like, I think it was negative 17 ish weather. Mm, that's good. Just, and I haven't started it since. Um, so now that's sitting in the barn and it really, I hope he doesn't listen to this, but my plan has been since uh, then just to lure David Tracy up here somehow and uh, have him, him yeah. set him loose. Yeah. Be like, Oh, David, there's, there's something wrong with the Jeep. If you want to go take a look. <laughs> I'm sure I like his ability to resist fixing uh, old Jeeps is nil. Uh, no, so I, he'll, he'll do it. David's yeah. a great guy, dude. He'll, he'll definitely come in and try to resurrect that, which is yeah. good. Yeah. We, we wrenched um, up here prepping for an off-road trip um, a few months ago. And I think um, he's eager to get back up here and hang. Cause he was one of the few people like, that was allowed to come visit us during uh, like real lockdown times because yeah. lives alone, doesn't see anybody. And right. we felt like that was safe enough. Um, but so he's been up here a few times and he's eager to get back and he doesn't know, I think the full extent of the project yet. So like, I well, said, hopefully, about, like you said, he won't listen to this because yeah, then he'll yeah, call okay. you and be like, what did, why, why are you trying to kill me? Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> I, he's, but the thing is, he loves it. Uh, he, what could, what could be, make David happier than, than fixing my old Jeep? Fixing his, of old course, Jeep. Yeah, of course, which would be better. But, uh, well, dude, let me, let me ask you a question. So, when you, and this is kind of going a little bit back to Jalopnik itself, mm -hmm. right? So, Jalopnik has always been, for those, I, I can't imagine there's a car person out there that doesn't know about there, Jalopnik. There are a few. It's been surprising, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, been reading Jalopnik literally since I started getting into the car world and it's been kind of that mainstay, right? It's, it's like one of those things. It's like you wake up in the morning, you have your coffee, you go to Jalopnik and you see what's going on. Yeah. It's like one of those things. Um, it has been such a, a car culture hub, everything from OEM to off-roading to what's going on in the industry to motorcycles, to this, that, and the other thing yeah. um, that how, how have you been able to, when you came in a year ago, kind of bring that back? Because it was a little, it started to, to sweat a little bit, I think, there for a time. Yeah. And uh, now it's back in full effect, which is just such a brilliant thing. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think a lot of um, what would kind of qualifies me to the degree that you can say I'm qualified for the job. Uh, but like what... Um, I think helps with Jalopnik is that I was a Jalopnik reader from day one too. So like mm -hmm. um, starting in like 2006, 2007, I was reading literally every single post mm -hmm. on Jalopnik for years. Um, so the kind of lore in the spirit of it is uh, like, you know, and, and it was something that was kind of uh, second nature to me as far as, you know, knowing uh, Johnny and Davey and mm -hmm. Phil Yep. Bump and all those guys and like just having that um like you know 
knowing kind of the story of Jalopnik, like, okay, this is how uh, it was when Spinelli was running it. This is how yep. it changed when work came on. This is how uh, it changed when Hard Degree came on. And, you know, like throughout the uh, Travis and, and Patrick and knowing all the people who worked there, I think like allowed me a little bit to, um, to maintain a connection with the audience where it's, you know, it's uh, when we, we talked about kind of getting back um, and, and building traffic back up, um, you know, having a sense for what the audience liked historically and didn't like and what would turn them off um, helped a lot. And I, you know, in that sense, it, it's a lot like what we did at Auto Week, um, mm -hmm. my previous job, which was uh, kind of a, a rebrand and, and a rethink on what Auto Week was. Um, but that had to be done with a lot of respect and a lot of care uh, for the people who had been there. Sure. 60 years and I think like with with Jalopnik um it's similar you don't have 60 years of history but you have a pretty substantial amount of history 15 years or more mm -hmm. and if you're going to come in as the new guy you know having a very um like fan fanboyish mm -hmm. understanding of like the the lore and the history is um to me it was really helpful um so, and I, I think too, like, uh, I don't know if I, I've told you this, but like Johnny and Phil and um, those guys and Davey were like a part of me getting into writing, you know, when I was sure a reader every day, I would email Johnny and say, Hey, I wrote something. Will you read it? And he'd say, yeah, sure. And like, uh, when I, you know, Phil got me, uh, he recommended me for my job at Auto Week. Um, and like Davey was my, uh, the counterpart when I started mm -hmm. that week and he was our West coast editor. And like, um, you know, I owe a lot to the site and I feel like, um, you know, it's really cool to be in a position to like, um, to be a part, like to be a real part of it, not just a yeah. weird. Oh yeah, I know you're part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're I'm in on the now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not just a weirdo. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been cool and it's been cool to like, it's been cool to bring it back um, without changing what Jalopnik is. You know what I mean? Right. I, I think there's a lot of temptation too when things aren't going well um, at a at a publication or whatever to be like, well, you know, we got to do something different. We got to we got to change and, and figure something out. And I think like, you know, we've we've changed some th things on the margins and and we've improved some process stuff, but. By and large, it, it reads like Jalopnik and the site is still Jalopnik. Um, yeah. So uh, that is something I think um, that I'm really proud of. And I, I think like, you know, God, when you have something that is as beloved as uh, Jalopnik is, uh, it would be a real shame to come in and start screwing with it. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think the formula is... is is kind of tried and true. I think the stories and the writers that you have now are some of the best in the business. Oh, cool. um, and the nice part is the variety. It yeah. is never, it is never the same. You go there, you're going to fulfill whatever automotive need that you, you feel is lacking in your mind. And right. That is the weird thing about it. Like when I, when I first started, you know, I have, um, you know, whatever, how many years of uh, automotive like programming for like, what's going to work content wise and sure. um what i see uh, what i saw at jalopnik the people would put stories in slack and be like oh i'm gonna write about this and like every time i was like oh boy i don't know if that's a good idea or like i don't know if that's a good use of time that story would take off and it was like you have to rewire your brain for um you know what works at other publications yeah um versus what works with Jalopnik audience. I mean, I, I remember seeing uh, David Tracy took like three days off early uh, in my tenure to do um, uh, Bronco versus uh, Wrangler, like a deep dive, a uh, technical yep. dive. It was like 5,000 words. And I was like, dude, that is such a waste of time. Like no one <laughs> has words on the internet. And he was like, trust me, trust me. Like, it'll be good. And you know, it ended up being, I, at the time, it was one of our biggest stories, like half a million people read it and like 75% of them um, 
read all of it or read like over 80 that's insane. That, insane that that's nuts no one does that like no who right. are the people but like that's that is what um is cool about jalopnik is it's like um you can do that stuff and you can tell david or or uh whoever to go do something weird and watch it pay off because like a the the editors i think who have been there for a long time have a really finely tuned um understanding of what the readers want and b mm -hmm. like the readers are weird and like oh yeah they're gonna read a bunch of uh they're gonna read stuff that won't work everywhere else um, yeah that'll be interesting if i ever try to get a different job because i will be uh, again totally uh, <laughs> from from uh, my time at Jalopnik. so hopefully that is <laughs> well let me ask you this so we went to we mentioned earlier that we had gone to pebble beach you know a yeah. couple of weeks ago and I, I would say it was probably 60% capacity, maybe 70% capacity yeah, to what it, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Obviously we're, we're still in the world of COVID and we've got the Delta variant now, which is really exciting. And obviously we're going to have the Zeta Omega and however elementary variants are going to come down the pike yeah. um, because there will be right. Yep. Um, yep. What do you think is going to happen? Cause seem is right now, two months away, three months away. Yeah. What, but the, the difference between pebble Pebble Beach is outdoors for the most part, right? Most part, yeah. But SEMA is a hundred plus thousand people inside yep. in a big tuna can. Yeah. What do you, what are you thinking? You think they're gonna do it? What do you think? I mean, how because I'm on, I'll be honest, I'm getting a little sketched. Yeah. Um I mean, I'm fully sketched. I'm not going. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. I I but I'm also um probably more sketchable than other people on this stuff just because of some uh family medical history sure. but um my uh my gut when i saw new york was was canceled yeah you know, i was like there's no way they're doing pebble beach because like yeah most of the events are outdoors and that's great but everyone's flying in everyone's mm -hmm. staying in hotels everyone's going out to eat you know all those things those are all happening indoors so yeah and, and the trip that we were on um, took place almost exclusively. At, actually, I think it took place every meal, every uh, outdoor uh, uh, condo situation. Um, everything was outdoors. So I was like, you know, probably fine. Um, but I don't just, you know, I was joking earlier that like Pebble Beach was going to be like Sturgis for rich people where it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's bagging on the Sturgis people. And I think, you know, to a large degree, rightly so, for, for yeah. Sturgis and taking that risk. Because, um, you know, probably I would guess that the rates of vaccination are lower there than at Pebble Beach. But I was like, you know, no one's going to bag on uh, the Pebble Beach people because they're all, you know, rich. Uh, everybody's loaded. And everybody's loaded. And, like, no one gives them shit about anything. So, like, um, the... Uh, the, I was surprised. Like I said, I was surprised they did it. Um, and I was, I was joking about how they should shut it down. I, actually, I, I did think they should shut it down. Uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I, having been to, to um, SEMA as many times as I have, I, I would imagine with the clientele, the people who run it, um, and the attitude of Las Vegas generally, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I just, I don't see him shutting it down. I, mean, I could see. I can't that, imagine. Yeah. I could see doing some like um, some reduced capacity in places and, and trying to move some of the stuff outdoors, maybe leave some of the doors open. I, I don't know what you do, but like, I just don't see it. And especially like at, at this stage, I think too, like uh, with a lot of this stuff, the, um, the kind of lull pre Delta um, kind of, you know, and, and I think the availability of vaccines too, um, you know, made us all feel a little more comfortable. Yeah. You know, I, I decided to go to Pebble Beach in whatever July and I was like, oh God, yeah. you know, by August, be fine. be fine. Like who cares? Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of events that probably, you know, had things stayed more steady over the summer, um, a lot of events that probably would have and should have gone canceled or gotten canceled uh stayed on the books because it was like well shit mm -hmm. like hey yep. we're two months out. we're not you know we're not canceling a year in advance here we're canceling two months out and there's going to be some costs incurred for some oh, yeah. oh yeah um, 
So we'll see. I mean, hopefully uh, everybody is uh, vaccinated and uh, conscious of when is a good time to, to wear a mask and all that stuff at SEMA. And, you know, we avoid getting a lot of people sick. Um, I don't know that that's the case, but, um, you know, here's hoping. And, and I think, um, you know, I'm vaccinated. Everybody I know, uh, save for one person, as it come as it <laughs> come to find out, <laughs> vaccinated. Uh, and I have not uh, been sick, uh, or I've not. Um, I have uh, I have uh, donated about uh, twenty thousand dollars to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation unintentionally, uh, but I'm looking into that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, that was that was no. I'm just joking. No, there's been no ill. <laughs> I feel fantastic. Uh, everybody I know who's had it has felt fantastic. And, um, you know, it, it is better, I think, getting vaxxed and going into those situations than, um, than not and worrying about, you know, getting somebody, you know, say sure. some poor schmuck who uh, can't get work off to go uh, get the vaccine sick or, or uh, somebody else. So sure. uh, hopefully, hopefully that's what happens and hopefully you know, people stay relatively safe. I mean, I love going to SEMA. I know you do too. It's like, yep. um, it's a great place to see people and it's a great, uh, place to just walk around and, and see, um, there's a lot of really smart people, um, making incredible stuff. And, um, it is always fun to go like immerse yourself in that. Uh, and, you know, I think there's some small C parts of it, like some parts of SEMA that are, there easy. always is. Cheesy. I mean, see, yeah, SEMA yeah. always has a little bit of cheese in it, yeah. but that's, that, I think that makes it. That's part, that's part of the fun. Of fun man. It's in Las Vegas. Like, that's in Vegas. Cool. Yeah. You got to have uh, some cheese. Yeah. And I, I think, um, but it's cool. It's cool to go see like the imagination and, and like, you know, especially like a lot of smaller companies, like figuring stuff out and, and like I said, making cool stuff. I, I, I'm going to miss it this year, but I will be back when, when I believe that it's uh, safe to go back and, um, and I'll, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to that, but I, like I said, I hope everyone's, um, making good decisions and, and being grown up about this and looking at the, uh, the information and, um, well, I think that that's what we're all hoping. Right. So, well, all right. So now, now let me ask you this, yes. right. So we'll see, we'll see what happens with SEMA knock on wood. It, well, we'll see what happens with SEMA. Um, with everything that's going on in the industry right now, we uh -huh. know there's this, this massive chip shortage. You know, we know that used car prices are through the roof right now, the highest they've ever been to buy anything that's used. Um, but when we talk about new cars, what, yep. what, what's coming out that you're excited about? Like do new cars, do new cars as an enthusiast still get you excited? Is yeah. there, is there stuff that's, that's coming out right now from any manufacturer where you're like, I can't wait to, to drive that or experience it. And, you know, I think that this particular vehicle is going to make an impact. Like what, what are you looking forward to? So, um, I mean, I, I'm looking like, so there's, there's a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I had been looking forward to the new Cadillacs, the, uh, black wing cars. Black wings. Yep. We talked about it at Pebble beach. I drove them, uh, whatever, a month ago now. You loved it. Incredible. Absolutely mind blowing. Like, if you're going to stop making gas cars, that is the note to go out on. Um, okay. It's a big statement. Yeah. I mean, I, I genuinely think probably, um, you know, both of those cars could be like top 10 sedans of all time. Uh, wow. Both of them like okay. mind boggling and probably uh, maybe higher than that. I, I, I have yet to make the, the mental list, but they're okay. absolutely uh, mind blowing cars. So um, excited about that. Um, you know, and I'm excited to see in that, that vein, some of these last, uh, gas cars come out. Um, but I think more than that, I'm excited, uh, you know, and, and I, I think too, like my hope, uh, and I, I'm sure yours is that I'll always be able to, on some level, go out and do a rip in, in one of my gas cars, um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, do it, uh, you know, probably not commute in a gas car, probably not do, you know, my big road trips in a gas car, but you know, have them become, you know, like a sailboat or something that is, uh, enjoyable and fun. <laughs> sure. I, like the sailboat analogy always makes sense to me. Cause it's like, 
you know, you can buy a $2,500 sailboat, you can buy a, a $25 million sailboat. And right. uh, that technology has been outmoded for what, 200 some? Yeah, maybe? but it still yeah. works. Yeah, it still works. It's still fun. Still People still do it. Um, but, I, you know, I think like that's a good place for like personal gas cars to be yeah. where it's like anyone can still do it. It's still fun, but no one is yeah. depending on it for day-to-day -day transportation. Well, that's uh, like, we, we still get the, uh, we still get the questions like, you know, if, if I post a picture of like an older car, like a seventies car, they're like, you know, and you get somebody that's like, I'm going to drive that every day. And it's like, you're not going to want to drive this every day. Like take it from somebody who drives old junk. Like nobody wants to drive a big block charger every day. Yeah. I I've been nobody. down that road and I've done it uh, out of necessity sometimes, uh, <laughs> but, and, and like, that's certainly a young man's game, man. Like it, that's something I would oh, yeah. in the 20s, but like I'm not putting two kid seats in the back of my uh, <laughs> my, my 73 Beetle anymore. Uh, but um, I'll, the EV stuff, I I was talking to my wife last night and I was like, you know, uh, so I'm driving the Lexus on my commute, which is like a mile or two every day. Mm -hmm. um, and we bought that car to to take it to some national parks and do some like hard off-roading and like camp out of and stuff. It's like, I'm putting miles on it, although small amount of miles and putting miles on it, not using it for its intended purpose, which is not smart to do. So what I would like, and I was talking to the wife last night, I was like, you know, we should do, um, grab a used EV, something, um, so we can get a charger hooked up in the garage, sure. and start preparing for whatever. But it was like, man, the used EV, like pretty bleak. Like uh, as far as like there are good cars out there, but yeah, a lot, a lot of bad of, ones. Not a lot of cool cars out there is the thing. It's, uh -uh. Like, you know, it's like, I I think I would drive a, a Kia Soul EV. Wife says, okay. no. Wife says oh, that's really? too embarrassing. Uh, well, and, I mean, what are you going to drive a Prius? Like a Prius? You well, can't, yeah. can't go. I mean, I know that's not full EV, but you can't go down that road. Well, her, I, I would actually, I like, I don't, I don't hate the Prius. I don't hate any of these cars, but my wife's tolerance for being embarrassed driving is because <laughs> uh, I've had the experience uh, of, of being embarrassed by my car many times, but um, I, and, and I shouldn't say that I would be embarrassed, but it's like, I don't get excited. I'm not excited about the prospect of, you know, a first generation Nissan Leaf. Like that's not exciting. To oh, me. Um, no. but you know stuff like that canoe hopefully we'll see a canoe on the market okay. uh those things are are super rad looking um the rivian i'm really excited about rivian uh, yep um and then the bollinger um i you know we'll see that's not really my style but it'll be cool to see those on road on the road and then um uh, but but you know even stuff like the all electric uh the ford lightning uh is very exciting to me uh, I'm curious to see what the, what the adoption rate is on those things, because, you know, it was interesting when we did our road trip earlier this year, you know, we started in, in Michigan and we drove, you know, 37 miles around the U S and it wasn't really until we got back, like we left Michigan, there were EVs here and there yeah. we drove through the Midwest. We saw like two. And then really wasn't until we got back into California that EVs were obviously prevalent again. Oh, yeah. And I always look at, like are are the diehard gas people really going to convert? And I think there will be a time where they don't have a choice that they're going to have to convert. But I definitely applaud the manufacturers right now for coming out and really looking at how these vehicles are used in day to day life. Yeah, and saying no, no, we can we can make this we can make this work. And, yeah. and I think they are. Like I'm stoked about the F, you know the Lightning. I think that's going to be cool. Yeah, yeah, I would do a Lightning uh, that Lucid. I drove. Or oh my god. That so good so is awesome i mean i've never said i wanted an ev until i sat and went for a ride in the lucid and i was like okay i'm in yeah, i would yeah i'm on board here um yeah but I, I think like so for me like what i get out of you know driving a sports car or driving like a performance car is is very much tied to like gas so like uh, it's a manual transmission it's mm -hmm. weight it's uh all, all of those the character of an engine that revs uh is is very close to um that's the experience i want when i drive fast when i go for a rip on a back road mm -hmm. or whatever uh that's but like an ev truck uh that makes total sense to me like that's not a car that i drive 
uh, on a back road. That's not a car that I'm, right. I'm looking for an experience. I'm looking for something that provides some utility, Util- right. comfort, all, all that stuff. So um, I'm, I'm super excited for that. I, one that, that kind of straddles it for me was that uh, the Polestar 2 I really liked. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a car, again, that like in the lower spec, you know, the, perf- the performance aspect of, um, of EVs doesn't really mean anything. You know, I would prefer range in an EV to performance. Sure. I don't like, that's just not what I'm after. Um, sure. Which is why, you know, like the Tesla stuff. Well, there's a number of reasons why the Tesla stuff has never really made sense to me. Um, but primarily it's like, that's just not, not the experience I'm looking for. Um, right. You know. Well, what about, stuff you saw the, um, I'm sure you've seen that, that Dodge ad that came out. Yeah. Right. E-muscle. And of yeah. course it's Dodge. So four wheel burnouts, that whole thing. Do you do you think that there's they're going to be able to make an EV exciting to the masses in the same way that the muscle cars were exciting to the masses? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think like um, you know the the experience of a fast EV is is much I think much more um, aligned with the experience of a fast muscle car than it is with a, a fast sports car. You know, like. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the experience of accelerating it like in that lucid uh from a stop Ridiculous. is nuts and it like in the model s uh the plaid and even the performance uh model threes like it's really fun like it, it is it is a um a sensation that like you don't get anywhere like outside of a veyron you don't get yeah but it almost that so all the launches like whether it's a lucid or it's you know a plaid you can only, at least me personally, I can only do a launch like twice before I'm yeah. like, well, I'm going to go vomit now because yeah, right. like my guts are in the back of my body. And I just, it's just that it's so fast. They are so ungodly fast. But isn't that the point though? Like that's like, I, I mean, really fast. Like that's, that's, they, the, I think that's the point of like a demon, right? Is like, yeah, but the, the, the thing about the demon was that, and, and, you know, and having spent a bunch of money on a demon, right? Yeah, right. Um, one thing about the EVs that that I miss, and I like I said, EV going from here to San Francisco to Los Angeles, sitting there in in complete bliss, comfort, yeah. luxury, that appeals to me like nothing else. Yeah. Straight line speed, like drag strip or or something like that. I there's no theater there for me. Right. And, and I like the one thing about the demon was you would get in, it would blah, 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 make all the crazy sounds. And then it would break loose at 70 and spit you sideways. And you're like, Holy crap. While the RPMs are go through the, there yeah. was theater. There was like, Oh my God, I could, I, I might die. Like I literally might die. And I, I miss that. Like as a, as a petrol guy, I, I miss that. So I could see, just like you said, yeah. Evie, get me point A to point B in silence, in luxury, in, in, just comfort but i do miss that that muscle and i'm really curious as to how they're gonna trigger that auditory sense yeah i I think that you know for a lot of people who are probably like less into it than you and like less into it than me and less like um jaded kind of like yeah i feel like i need uh certain things to enjoy a, a car uh whatever um but I think, you know, for the average person who maybe was a, um, a Dodge uh, customer, um, that sensation of uh, acceleration is going to be really powerful and fun. Like, uh, especially, you know, people who may not have had a demon, but who, who now sure. have that sensation of um, speed available kind of, you know, to a degree across the, the lineup. I think, like, that could be really cool. I, but I, I think, too, like, we're not at that stage. I think, you know, we're at the stage right now between like the earliest adopters who are like, you know, whatever the, the people who bought Tesla's, the people who bought bolts and um, leafs and that kind of stuff. Um, and we're on the edge of like mass uh, market availability, which mm-hmm. there's no, you know, no guarantee that'll turn out into it turn into um mass adoption i mean i think that's one of the really interesting things about this whole moment is the automakers are all on board and they're all 
seemingly investing their money. Uh, but the mechanism to drive adoption is the market. Yeah. There's no other mechanism. There's, I mean, right. there's sure. some incentives, some tax incentives, which only really apply to people who are making enough money where the tax incentives make a difference. You know, like if you're uh, making uh, an average amount of money uh, in America, the, the seven seventy five hundred dollar tax rebate yeah. doesn't mean anything to you because you're not sure you're not, you're not there. Money. Yeah, you're not there. So um, so there's there's really no. You know, aside from people experiencing these things and determining that they're better for them, there's not really a mechanism for adoption. So, or for for uh, incentivizing adoption. So I think like that to me is really interesting because it's like uh, you know you have all these automakers who are like, okay, we're on board, we're putting our billions yep. here. Yeah, and there's a chance. Uh, there's a chance that people might say like, no, nah, I'm comfortable with my car. Like I, I, I like being able to fill up in the, uh, the gas station. Do, do you and, think the used car prices are going to stay because of that, because of everything that's coming down with the EVs? Do you think that, it, you know, cause like I said, used car prices are at an all time high right now. And do you think people are just going to be holding on to their stuff? No, longer? I mean, I think for a long time, you know, like when the tap gets put back on for, um, for uh, from the chip shortage, yeah. you know, whatever the the percentage of the fleet is, I don't, I don't know. It's eighty five percent probably. Uh, all the cars being sold in the U.S. are probably gas yeah. cars. So like, there's going to be plenty of gas cars available for a long time. And like, you know, whatever twenty probably new gas cars got announced this year. You know that those yeah. cars ten ten year cycle and 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 a lot of people. Um, people are holding on to cars for 10 and 11 years. So I think like yeah. the adoption of the EV thing has the potential to be really, really slow. Um, I think with any new technology that, especially in an environment where you see people holding on to cars for 10 or 11 years, um, just the, you know, there's 280, 279 million cars on the road in the United States. <laughs> so, and people are holding on to them for, uh, for 10, 10 years. years. And you start doing the math there and it's like, you know, we're talking about a, a 20, 30, maybe more years. Yeah. Before we start to see any, any new technology, any new uh, type right. of car uh, penetrate. So um, I think, I think that part of it's interesting. I think the, um, you know, the, the beta versus VHS thing is, is really <laughs> uh, interesting. It's like, you know, American history has like these moments where um, consumers reject superior technology for illogical reasons. And like, nobody really knows why it's just like, right. yeah, well, a lot of, a lot of times there's like external factors, you know, uh, there's marketing and um, maybe some titles or, or whatever uh, people fiddling around the edges. Like this one, it's like, if gas is cheap, um, it's going to be hard to get people into EVs. Like, I, I think like the average person probably doesn't, um, doesn't care enough about the environment, uh, to make a 20 to 50,000 decision based on that. I mean, I, I wish they well, did, but I mean, it, it, I know where, where I am in California with gas at five bucks a gallon. Yeah. Right. Um, it hurts. Like I daily a Bronco, I daily a 25 year old Bronco with a 33 gallon fuel tank that gets 12 miles to the gallon. I'm so the, oh, with the Lexus right now. Yeah. So when I go to the gas station and I'm like, well, wow, that was $110 to fill that up with 87. You're just yeah. like, son of a bitch. And that's when you go and you go, well, literally if I fill it up three times a month, yeah, you paid, for I it. could go out. It's I paid for an EV that yeah. cost me an eighth of that yeah. right and but, you go okay it doesn't have the style and it doesn't have the 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 feel that i want potentially but god damn that money's really nice to have yeah and i i, I think though um you know in most of the country gas is cheap ish still um mm -hmm. or anyway like uh we're not at a pain point certainly at the pump um it, the other the other thing is i think um the the a lot of people don't have the money to purchase a different car even if it's oh no question even if it's a cheaper car um you know you look at what's happened in the new car market um 
there are virtually no twenty thousand sub twenty thousand dollar cars anymore because the people. What they say the average is forty thousand dollars now for a new car. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think over forty thousand for the first time. But I think, um, you know, that it gets you get into some socioeconomic discussion here. But I think like the um, the reason there are no sub twenty thousand dollar cars isn't because there are no people uh, at the bottom of the market. It's because the people at the bottom of the market cannot afford a new car, period. Uh, right. They can't afford to register a new car. They can't afford to insure a new car. They can't afford any aspect of, of changing over to a new car. So I think, um, you know, that the idea of like, okay, yeah, getting an EV for, for those folks would be awesome for them. They would be awesome for, you know, for the environment It'd be awesome for the car makers. But like, again, what is the mechanism for that? And I think, you know, I, I've been, um, you know, I, there, there are certainly mechanisms that, that could, be done, uh, could be made available, um, you know, uh, some, some degree of uh, public um, financing for this stuff or, I mean, and we're spending the money anyway, so it's, it's sure. not. <laughs> there's a lot of ways I think people can go. And, and when you look at, um, I think you're absolutely right. Why, right? when you look at the, the actual entrance point yeah. for a new car, right? Like you said, people aren't buying $20,000 cars, one, because they don't exist. But when you think about, we live in a time of 84, 120 month car loans. We live in a time of, you know, insurance is, is still a pretty penny out there. Fuel owning a vehicle, especially a new vehicle is very, very expensive. It is not a cheap endeavor. Um, when you really break it down, it's a it, it's a massive part of your income, right? Yep. Um, and so I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that a lot of people are, are just going to go, Ooh, uh, yeah, this isn't financially viable for me to do this. Yeah, or it's just, those are people who have never considered, uh, generationally yeah. considered buying a new car. And I, I think too, like, um, all of those things are more expensive when you're poor. So like um, the less money you have, um, the more you're going to pay in insurance because you probably live in an area where insurance rates are high. Yada, right. yada, yada. You know, up, up and down the board, there's um, there are all these barriers, which I think like, um, you know, it, like I said, that'll, that'll be very interesting to me. I think, um, you know, from a, a policy standpoint, I think, if we get to a situation where um, GM and Ford and Mercedes-Benz and all these companies are uh, five years into an EV changeover and the market is not happening, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens um, yeah. as far as um, intervention, as far as, you know, th those companies lobbied really hard um, to make cash for clunkers happen. Um, and they've, they've lobbied really hard to, um, put their kind of finger on the scale for other policies that help them sell cars in the past. Yep. And boy, you know, it seems like at least, uh, with what the government says and what all the automakers are saying, it sounds mm -hmm. like they're aligned there. Like we need to get EVs in the market. We need to get them into the hands of consumers. Sure. You know, you could do something like a, some uh, tie it to student loan forgiveness you could tie it to um you know another car like cash for clunkers like you know we had um that was which by the way was a disastrous idea absolutely <laughs> yeah, down the board i mean we can all agree that was a yeah. huge mistake but you know uh that's never never kept you, you learn from it Don. well yeah. Yeah, i mean the fact I that mean, a huge mistake in the past doesn't necessarily keep the government from making a huge mistake again in the future but well, um, no, we've seen that repeatedly. Yeah, they, <laughs> they love it. It's, they're like me; they don't learn their lessons. But uh, I think the, um, I think um, something like that, you know, with EVs and, and, and all joking aside, with with some of the lessons from from cash for clunkers, um, could could happen. I, I could see that. I could see the automakers um, coming to to Washington in, in a few years and saying, "Hey, look." Uh, we held up our end here. Um, we've we've put our tens of billions of dollars into uh, this effort. Um, we need a hand, and right. uh, uh, and I could see that happening. Um, which which hopefully again, hopefully it doesn't get to that point. Hopefully, um, the more people uh, encounter 
cool and fun and practical EVs, the more those trickle into the used market and the more people kind of experience like, oh, hey, I don't need a car with 700 miles of range uh, for my whatever, 30 minute five commute. mile commute. Yeah. Uh, then well, that, that begins to happen naturally. So we'll see. Well, I'll tell you, dude, we're, we're coming up. That's that's almost an hour. Jesus, that went fast. Okay. I can talk, man. I, you sent me. Talk, man. <laughs> well, that's why you're here. You, yeah. you know, I mean, inside that you're fun of a buddy. Like it's, it's what we want to do. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of the conversation is to talk about things that most people just might not think about right in the automotive world and the space that we're in and, you know, the new technology that's coming out. And, you know, I, I think so much time shows are, are based around just performance and or culture and or everything, which don't get me wrong. I mean, that's, that's jalopnik as a whole but i know knowing you it's always wonderful to have these conversations because i think a lot of people just learn a lot and it makes them open their eyes a little bit and say okay maybe i don't need to go out and have like you said that 700 mile bridge between stops because no one does that right unless yeah. you're a long haul trucker you're not driving 700 miles a day right right so it's it's food for thought it's something to think about i think the next 10 years in the automotive world are going to be really interesting yep you know, I, um, I will say, you know, and I, I think if we're, if we're trying to wrap up one thing that has led me uh, in this, in the way that I think about this stuff is I, like I said earlier, I want to be able to drive my gas powered cars uh, through, through the, uh, the end of my natural lifespan. Uh, I'd love to leave them to my kids. Uh, you're the same way. Um, and, you know, all the guys we hang out with are the same way. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I think from a policy standpoint and from a, um, just looking at the world standpoint, if that's what you want, and if you want to have that experience uh, long into your future, um, then the flip side of that coin is to get all of the people who don't care about that stuff um, and to get your daily commute uh, into whatever the most uh, kind of responsible, mm -hmm. um, shape you can get it. In. So if that means you talk your auntie into an EV, um, when she's ready, uh, that means you switch out your daily driver for an EV when you're ready. Um, that's, that's a necessity. We're, we are not, um, going to be able to continue to have 279 million, uh, gas powered cars on the road. That's, that is not yeah. happening. The, whether it's public policy or, or what the automakers will choose to make or, or what, um, that is going to change. There's nothing you can do about it that's going to change. Um, so um, if you want to, uh, like I said, uh, not have your cars banned uh, and not have the government force that, that to happen, um, the key is to get emissions down, to get fuel usage down and that means to stop using fuel for uh, dicking around and, and commuting and uh, driving to church and, and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm an advocate for EVs and I, I try to keep an open mind about, uh, about doing that. And I, and I think the way to do that, like I said, is to think about this is, this is what allows me uh, to have my fun cars uh, is yeah. being, uh, being a good boy uh, during the week. Well, dude, I, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. I think that uh, we're, we're going to see this change come through, whether we like it or not. And I think starting with people opening their eyes and saying, yes, I do want to enjoy my, my petrol powered cars for the next 25 years or so, or however, next hundred, it doesn't matter. But yes, different strategies are going to have to be adopted by the driving public. And listen, that's our job, right? Our job yeah. is as the people that, that, you know, like yourself as, as the IAC of J Jalopnik and myself is doing video and, and podcasting and stuff like that is to constantly get that message out to people and open their eyes a little bit, you know, make them, make them think a little bit, which is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful for people to question. Questioning is great. And I yep. think they need to, um, yep. but also educate themselves. So dude, thank you so much for yep. coming on, man. It is always awesome to see you. It's always awesome to bullshit and just yeah, talk like cars and everything else. Um, and I think that we we also if you, if you need another driver, let me know for lemons because like absolutely, absolutely, I'm a, nice I'm a fan. They have another tall guy in the car, so I can we won't have yeah. to see. It. Uh, <laughs> good good hearing from you, dude. And I hope we can do this again um, uh, before too long. 
And uh, thanks again for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. can everybody find you? So where can everybody find Rory? Where can they learn about you? Where do you want them to go? Uh, go to Jal- now, now is the time to plug. <laughs> go to jalopnik.com and uh, click on as many articles. I don't care if you read them. Just click on them and close. Just read them. That'd be great. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at Rory underscore Carol and on Instagram at Rory underscore Carol. And I think that's all the stuff I have. I think that's all my, that's all I do. That's it. That's what you yeah. got. Pretty much. That's all I got. I, I don't have a podcast. I don't have a, um, uh, what are the other things that you do? TikTok. I don't have one of those. Um, well, that's knows. fine. You could just keep coming back to us. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to. That'd be awesome. Good. I love it. Dude, thank you so much for coming on, buddy. And I'll talk to you very, very shortly. Yep. Thank you. All right, Red. Okay. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button. And we'll come to you every week.